These 3D printed prosthetics are the products of permissionless innovation. The fact that these, uh, these 3D printing devices and these tools are in the hands of individuals who can now explore, experiment, and create these, uh, these prosthetic body parts opens up um, a range of options for how these things could be created, what they look like, what they feel like, how they're controlled. Um, and the hope is, in many cases, and I know to some degree it's Joel's hope, that soon they might even outperform the current limbs on the market uh, today. Um, and the thing that these 3D printed prosthetics do are, are threefold in one way. They solve uh, three key problems. One, the cost. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the media exaggeration around cost on this panel. Two, they solve a very um, uh, specific problem when it comes to children who outgrow their prosthetic limbs very quickly and they're developing uh, both psychologically and socially and um, often these larger uh, limbs that are available on the market are not always appropriate. And also they allow for uh, design at a distance. They allow a community to come together and explore uh, how they can iterate on some of these uh, designs. And the best example of this you may have all seen, I suppose, is the Collective Project, which in actual fact was a uh, Microsoft-sponsored media campaign where Robert Dowie Jr. handed over prosthetic limb created by Limitless Solutions, a company who are part of Enable, which I know Jeff is part of. And the question is, this is great but it's for one child. How do, you, how do you scale it? And equally, not impossible labs have been doing work in South Sudan. Again, there's issues of uh, how, do they, how do they scale this sort of innovation? What's the support that they're giving um, South Sudan in the creation of these prosthetic limbs? And the Enable Institute, who are doing absolutely fantastic work, um, I, and Jeff will probably speak more about Enable, but they're a network of individuals, uh, about 400, uh, maybe even 900 now, I think was the last count. 5,000. 5,000 individuals with prosthetic, uh, with, sorry, with 3D printers who are linked to young children with congenital limb defects, and uh, they print prosthetics, um, open source prosthetics with designs available freely on uh, Thingiverse, and they ship those prosthetics uh, to these kids. And you still see there's still, some, uh, there's still some challenges, and those challenges are what we're going to explore on the panel today, because there's exaggerated media claims around the cost of a, of a limb versus the actual cost of a, a 3D printed limb. Equally, there's issues around hygiene factors. These limbs are fantastic, but when it comes to fitting it to a human individual, um, sometimes the plastics can, can rub, sometimes because they're so brittle, they can break, they become sharp, and... The parents are getting the super glue out to stick these back together. And equally, there's an issue about quality control. Is this a medical device? Well, prosthetics are class one exempt devices already, but will this be looked at as um, as, as important and as uh, useful as the devices that are available on the market? So I want to introduce three absolutely fantastic panelists. Firstly, Nigel Ackland, who is the B-Bionic prosthetic pilot. Uh, Jeffrey um, Aaronstone, <laughs> who's got your last name wrong? Jeffrey Aaronstone, uh, who's come all the way from the U.S., just got off a plane this morning, so uh, um, you know he needs to be augmented with coffee. And of course, Joel, who you've just heard from. And I want to kick off by asking Nigel about his story specifically as a as a prosthetic pilot of receiving not a 3D printed limb, but a uh, B bionic limb, one of the most advanced limbs on the market and the five years of different limbs that you went through before you got to this device? Yeah, well, um, my, my journey started by accident in uh, 2006, and in 2007 I became an amputee. Uh, I went on a standard treatment plan, so I've had quite a few of the prosthetics. I started with a passive limb, uh, moved on to a, a body-powered system, which is a hook powered by a piece of string. Then I moved on to an electric uh, like lobster claw, which is pretty effective and pretty functional. And then I was fortunate to get this. Um, this came purely by chance. Uh, my major problem was getting sockets to fit. So after five years, I, I could afford to get a privately made socket. And then this came along. And my whole life changed. It, it, it might sound trite, but prior to this, I'll be honest, I was suicidal. Uh, I saw no future. Um, 
What can I do? Uh, I'm an old guy. I've got one arm, half my leg missing, and I, I've got six tenths in my heart. Uh, not really worth staying around. This has given me a reason to be out here. This, because of this, I've, I've met Joel and, and you know, these, these people who, who've got this mission. I don't want anyone to go through what I went through. And if, if, if the Enable and, and the Open Hand Project and, and similar 3D technology can make limbs cheaper, more available, to, to people who really need them, then that, that's the whole reason for me being here. You know, there are 12 and a half million upper limb amputees. There are about 300 of these. It's not fair, you know. So I think uh, 3D printing is definitely the way to go. Even if it's only a, a stopgap thing, yeah, we, you might have reliability problems, but you have reliability problems with this. A 3D finger's gonna break. Well, these break. It's yours break. It's a fact of life. But when these break, we just screw another one on. You guys are in plaster for six weeks. So, weigh it up. So, Jeff, you've had experience of fitting both limbs like the B Barnick and 3D printed prosthetic limbs. Uh, firstly, could you tell us about some of the work you do, obviously, and, and also tell us the different challenges of fitting something like the B Barnick or the Eye Touch versus um, some of the limbs that Joel or the Enable community create? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, well, I'm a, a certified prosthetist. Uh, I have a practice in the United States in uh, Northern New York. Um, you know, and there I just sort of take care of you know people like Nigel and, and uh, all different amputees of the of that area. On top of that, I'm I'm kind of an expert in adaptive sport stuff, and I have uh, devices that I've developed for Paralympic teams. Uh, you know, the, like the U.S. Nordic uh, Paralympic ski team. I've I've developed their sit skis. I think there's a there's a video or something like that of one of the ones that I developed and we're actually now currently working on a carbon fiber version of it. Uh, and on top of that I do kind of other very specialized prosthetics uh, for adaptive sports. I developed uh, some rowing legs for someone who wanted to row crew. Uh, I think there's another video of that as well. But uh, you know, very specialized type of thing. So it's, it, it, I'm already been out of the normal scope of what a prosthetist does. And so when it, you know, 3D printing came along, it, it definitely it, it perked my interest because it allows us to go even farther out of the, the traditional. You know, there is value to the traditional, but there is also value to these newer technologies. So, Joe, some of the work you've been doing with Open Bionics, have you been working with prosthetists directly? And what are some of the key things that you've learned on that journey about how to fit the Open Bionic hand to, to a, a user? Yeah, yeah, we, we've um, we've been trying to. I actually had a really, really good conversation with Jeff just bef just before we, we spoke about um, about how he fits prosthetics, and uh, we we very much want to we we want to do this work in a way that that not only revolutionises the current industry but but works with the current industry. Uh, I think that's really the only way to 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 make the change. You can't just write off a, a ton of. Um, you know, a, a huge industry that, that does, in a lot of cases, work incredibly well at the moment. Um, and uh, yeah, we've been trying to speak with as many prosthetists as we can. They're actually quite hard to find, I've found. <laughs> <laughs> but it's events, events like these, typically, when we meet people and we have these, these really fruitful conversations. So, for instance, what, what me and Jeff were speaking about was the, the, the um, fits that we've been doing we've, have, have been pr pretty rudimentary. We've been taking a 3D scan and, and uh, then essentially fitting the socket directly so that, it, that, so that it forms perfectly around the 3D scan. But as Jeff was telling me, that's not necessarily the best thing in a prosthetic. Sometimes you have certain sensitive areas of the skin where you don't want any material contact. You have other areas where, where you, you, um, you need to, you need to well, fit tightly so that you can have the purchase so that the, the, the limb doesn't fall off. Um, and so I think it's these kind of collaboration, co collaborations that will really make the technology integrate well into the current system. And Nigel, I know you went through that experience over Yeah, I mean, five socket, years. socket technology for arms is, is really, really lacking, uh, unless you go to the private sector. Um, my, my first uh, prosthetic was an inch and a half longer than my left arm. And when I walked down the street, it would get longer and longer and longer and, and then it would fall off because the suspension method just wasn't good 
for my stump. And unfortunately, when you heard earlier about breast implants being uh, four sizes, it's the same with socket liners, small, medium, large. Now, my stump flares. Most stumps taper. All the socket liners that you get taper. So if I had a, a liner that was secure here, it was so tight here I was in agony. If I had one that was secure, uh, nice and comfortable there, my arm would fall off. Now this one is a vacuum socket, and uh, just please, just grab the wrist and pull. <laughs> now, it doesn't come off unless I want it to come off. This is actually part of me, and socket technology is where we need to be pushing, and you know, the likes of 3D silicon printed liners and in uh, conjunction with, you know, low-cost 3D printed sockets, etc., it's got to be the way forward because it's affordable, it's replaceable, it's upgradable, and it doesn't. T this is 10 grand for goodness' sake, you know? That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And if we can utilise this technology that we have, and like they say, move in with private business and private enterprise, move in with the NHS or whatever. But just do it for the right reasons, not for on budgetary restraints, but on the benefits to the end user, the amputee. And second, socket technology really could do with advancements big time. Yeah. And I know, Jeff, that's exactly been your focus of yeah. socket specifically. And well, so there's, I mean, there's a. I would love to correct a couple of misperceptions. Um, what you got to understand is that a prosthesis. Prosthetists don't think of a prosthesis as a single unit. There, there's componentry, and we sort of assemble the componentry. So there's the, the socket, then there's sort of like the, the forearm section, could be endoskeletal, uh, you know, exoskeletal, and then there's a terminal device. Okay, so the terminal device is purchased. We just, we just buy it. So, you know, one thing I, I'm gonna, you know, so earlier you were talking about uh, the bebonic hand, and what, what price did you have up on your slide? Thousand dollars. Yeah. No, 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 for, no the, for the for the prosthesis, the conventional one. Yeah, yeah. So that hundred thousand includes fitting. Yeah. Right. So hundred thousand dollars. What did so? What did you? What did that hand? If you someone just, if you just wanted to buy that if, hand. If you wanted to buy the hand now, I think you'd have to you have to go through. Right. Distributors. Well, you were saying earlier. 15, I think cost 15, price 000. is about eleven or twelve, but to buy it, it's about fifteen grand. So you got to realize that what you've developed is actually a new terminal device to replace the fifteen thousand dollar thing, not the hundred thousand dollar. No, no, because our thousand dollars included fitting in a socket. Right. So that, but the what you were showing on the slides was just the terminal device. The price is no, now. Now you're now you're working on, and I know you're working on the the socket aspect as well. And and so you got to break it down because a lot of people when they're talking about three D printed prosthetics, they're actually mostly just talking about the hand itself maybe the forearm section, and they're comparing that to the full prosthesis, including the fitting, including what, you know, at least in the US, the insurance company gets money. <laughs> you know, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of associated costs, the liability, all that type of stuff is rolled into a, a big price that then gets discounted to what is actually paid, and then that part of that goes to the prosthetists themselves, part of it goes to the component manufacturers. So y y it's a very hard thing to compare you really do need to kind of compare apples to apples. Now, the, just to use the example that I was trying to raise is that if we were to take the terminal device and it was going to be like, you know, if you can make it for $1,000, it currently costs $15,000. That's 15 times cheaper. If 3D printing can make it 15 times cheaper, there's huge value to that. So there, so we, there is sort of a couple things we need to keep in mind is that there is a huge value to making these things less expensive. Um, just by using these newer uh, manufacturing methods. But that actually doesn't replace the socket. The socket still needs to be engineered. Now, could you just take a direct digital scan and make it out of semi-flex? You could, but that's not for every individual. You know, some individuals, their limb is the right way to be able to do that. Other individuals have scar tissue, they're, they're this vascular patients, uh, they have skin grafts, they have bony provinces and stuff like that where you have to load some areas and offload other areas. And that still takes the knowledge of a, a prosthetist to build that socket to adjust that model. So, it, you know, there is, a, there is room here to improve, absolutely. You, you had bad yeah. experiences, but then eventually, the, you know, a prosthetist didn't make this. Eventually they got it right. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's obviously room for the evolution of the prosthetic industry, but it's not a disruptive revolution. Yeah. It, it's, it's something that definitely needs to evolve 
but we're already use, utilizing 10 different types of technologies. We're now talking about 11. We should, you know, as a, the prosthetic industry should absorb this another technology because it's better in some aspects. But it's like I said, it's evolution, not revolution. And part of this is thanks to permissionless innovation. Anyone can pick up a 3D printer and potentially print a limb. And I know Open Barnex and Joel has been very open with their learning process. And I know you guys have gone over multiple iterations of limbs. And what's some of the things you've learned each time? And what would more interaction with prosthetists? And uh, equally, I know you spend a lot of time interacting with patients, and that's really the core of your research. What are some of those key learnings that you've taken away over the, it's been almost five year process now, I think. Um, yeah, maybe. well, yeah. I would say, yeah, in total, it's been, been, been about five years. So um, the, the biggest mistake that I made for ages was not asking my customers what they wanted. <laughs> it just sounds what, what do you want, Nigel? <laughs> <laughs> well done. Yeah. Yeah, which it's sounds so very stupid now, but now. but um, now now I mean we we we're only really trying to take people's feedback, take people's advice, and then incorporate it into our designs um, as best we can. There are some limitations, of of course. And what was one of the things that, that community came back and went? This is the thing we we want. Was it the we want a phone in our hand, or is no, there no, no. something more about the fit it's, issues? It's, I mean, we were trying to make a really cool robot hand that could do as much as we, we could make it do and, and was really complicated and uh, at a sacrifice of it becoming heavier, bigger, um, with a short battery life, needing a heavier battery, all of those kind of things, which isn't, isn't what people want. People, if you think about it, the, the technology, if you compare it to computing technology, when desktop computers came into the home, they were awesome. You could do loads of stuff on it, but you were never going to put that on your shoulder and take it to work. Hmm. And then laptops came along, and, and everything got a bit smaller. And yeah, you could take it to, to and from home to work, but you're still not taking your laptop everywhere with you, and you're not going down the shops with your, with your laptop because it's, it's still not quite portable enough. It was only when that computing technology came to the, the size and weight of a phone, put it in your pocket, that really you had access to it all of the time. It's the same with, with prosthetics. If you, if you make something that's really heavy and bulky and, and not necessarily comfortable to wear, people can't wear it all of the time. Whereas, so, so now we, we completely changed our focus on the, the weight of the device mm -hmm. and sacrificed a lot of things to make it as light as possible because that's the, bot the, the weight is a bottleneck. It can be as advanced as you want it to be, but if it's too heavy, people aren't going to want to wear it. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it, yeah. again, it, it reverts back to, like you were saying, about the component thing. If, if this piece isn't comfortable, that could be whatever you want. That's going to stay in the corner of the room because you can't wear it. I, I've done it myself. I, I wore a prosthetic for a couple of hours and then it would get taken off because it hurt too much. Kids nowadays, they tend not, or younger people, sorry, kids, <laughs> they, they don't like to wear the harnesses. You know, one lad I was speaking to, the first time he tried to climb a tree with his harness, he fell out the tree and nearly strangled himself. He won't wear a harness. Um, every child I spoke to at Reach back in October would wear something like this, which is basically an enable hand, an open button. They would wear that because it's cooler than what we can provide, which is functional and efficient and tried and tested and invented in 1862. We don't need that now. And as for making it, oh, it has to be a, a tested product for medical industry. Well, if you're born with an arm missing, a prosthetic is an optional extra. It's not a right. It's a lifestyle choice. Check it out. If you lose an arm, yeah, you can get a prosthetic. If you're born without one, you don't count. So. You know, we, we need to start addressing the, 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 the real situation and the unfairness with it all. I mean, if you, can, if you can make these things cheap and you can make them efficient, even if it's only for a year, give it for a year. Because when that person becomes of an age where they're able to use something along these lines, something that is more rugged or whatever, they will be at the age to use it, know how to do it, it will be comfortable to do it, it will be second nature to do rather than seeing teenagers walking around with long sleeves looking like goths or whatever because they're, they're not really able to wear what they'd like to wear. And you can print these out to be whatever you want them to be. You can design, you can add to them, 
the, the days of the pink plastic leg and arm have, have gone. I mean, people want things that look different. Why not? You don't all wear the same shoes. Why should we all wear the same arms? And difference is a, is a big factor. These children who want, for example, you were showing the uh, Iron Man um, limbs. Now, some of the challenges we we spoke about with regards to these prosthetic limbs may break. Now, I know that materials um, and advances in materials such as flexing materials are changing that. And I know that, uh, Jeff, I think you have the flexi arm with you yeah. um, to demonstrate. Um, so, again, the, the challenge for a lot of the enabled communities is the fact that these gentlemen 3D print these limbs, they ship them off, they turn up snapped or broken because of the brittleness of the material. And um, I think it was joked once at one conference that some of the people, and I'm not speaking for all of them, in the enabled community, a gentleman who bought their 3D, print, uh, 3D printer maybe a month or a month or two ago, and suddenly they've got to justify an $800 cost to their wife, and they've, they've printed their MIT bunny, and they go, oh, how do I justify this cost? They go on the internet, and they go, oh, I can print a limb, great, print that, send that. The only problem is it arrives broken, because not only did they not bubble wrap it, but they got the temperature gauge is wrong. Now I know that uh, flexi materials may solve some of the issues around the brittleness of the limbs. Yeah, yeah, I mean that, and, and, and that's sort of, uh, I, that's where I've been pointing was with these flexi materials for that reason. And I think what the Enable community, you know, which I'm an advocate for, I'm, I'm on the medical advisory board for them, but uh, what they need to be very careful about is the fact that, to, you know, to have someone make something you know, that's never made a prosthetic arm before, deliver it to a kid and just sort of send it in the mail, and then the thing breaks within a week, and th these things can't happen. We're messing with a kid's life. It's a big deal to get a prosthetic arm, and if it breaks within a week, I mean, you know, a lot of times these kids have been waiting forever, you know, they're really excited, you know, they've talked to them, it's gonna look, it's gonna look really awesome, you know, I, I, you know, I have an example, okay, so I had a new amputee in my office uh, two weeks ago. Uh, working on her first prosthetic. I came out with the prosthetic arm, walked in the room, and she just started crying. And I, and, and, and I was like, oh, oh, you don't like it? And she's like, I love it, but seeing that prosthetic arm made this real. It, like, it, you know, this was, it, it, it made the whole amputation, all the trauma involved, made it real to me. You know, and so you gotta, I hope that it makes you get a sense of how emotionally charged these individuals are. Um, a little bit less for someone who's born that way and they've been that way their whole life, but you know, if like a new amputee that it's happened, it's it's a it's a dramatic thing. To be able to provide something to someone that could break in a week, they, they put all their hope into that that device and it breaks, you just crush your dreams. And then and that's another reason I have a problem with like the comparisons to like, hey, this is a fifty dollar and these these other conventional prosthetics are so expensive you can't afford. Well what happens when the fifty dollar one breaks? Then the person's like, well, I'm not going to go get the one I can't afford. Well, what if they could afford it? What if they have insurance? What if they could go through NIS, you know, it, or NHS, NHS, whatever they you guys have over here. Uh, so then, you know, the point is, is that you, you got to be, it, it, you know, for people who are dabbling in 3D printed prosthetics, there is a serious downside that needs to be considered. There's huge upsides, but there is downsides. So, and, and, and you know, on the, on the topic of the upsides, uh, I mean, there's things that the prosthetic industry is learning from 3D printers. Namely, lightweight is really important. You know, I think there haven't been a lot enough devices that were lightweight enough. And something like Joel's is teaching us that we need to be careful about making the thing lighter weight. Uh, designing for kids, instead of taking an adult one and kind of miniaturizing it, that's, that's also important as well. The cosmetics sometimes is more important than the function, especially for kids, because if they're born that way, they probably adapted through their whole lives to be able to function without an arm. What, what we're doing is we're making the kid who's been walking around with his arm behind his back because he, he was shy about it to like turn him into freaking Iron Man. And he's like showing off to all the kids in school and everything like that. There is huge value to that cosmetic work. And, that, and that's something that the enable should be proud of and, and that you, know, you should too for what you're doing. And I want to ask Joel about the, what you're doing and the roadmap you guys have gone through is, is amazing. There's, I don't know if there's any other company like you guys who are really dogmatically focused on um, scaling prosthetic limbs. And there is a question of that scale. How do you see 
um, yourself rolling out the open bionic hand, would it be a, a giveaway? Would it be a print yourself? Will you supply it? Will it be a toy? Will it be a medical device? Have you thought about those questions? Yeah, we thought a lot about them, and yeah. it's yeah, it's quite difficult to to work out the exact the best way to do it. Um, so, in in most countries, there's a, there's a certain degree of uh, regulations you have to pass in order to sell a medical device as a medical device. And, and when Luke was referring to selling it as a toy, that's a way to potentially get around that. Um, we've, we've considered that option. We've decided to make it a medical device. The reason being, in that way, we can work with, with people like Jeff, prosthetists, have these things fitted professionally and, and in, the right, in, in, in an appropriate setting, i.e. A, a hospital or a, or a clinic. Yes. Um, and so we're, we're working on that. There's, there are still a few oh. loopholes within making it a medically certified device. Can you tell us what those are? Or? I can, yeah. So, so the, the, the device we're creating doesn't, doesn't actually fit into any of the categories that are currently available. Um, so there is a, is a category of, uh, in the UK regulation system, so there is a category of um, myoelectric hands um, to which Nigel's hand would fit in. Uh, and that's a class one medical device, needs to be CE approved. I hope I'm not boring anybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there's also a category, custom made devices. And if a device is custom made, it doesn't have to be CE, doesn't have to go through the CE process, but it can still be sold as a class one medical device. And so the, the hand we're making is both. It is it's completely customized. The ha the, we, we take a photo of somebody's hand and then the the model that we print is dimensionally fitted exactly to their specification, so it's truly their hand, but it's also a myoelectric hand. Um, so we've kind of got those two avenues. We can choose whichever one's easiest, and we're, we're trying to work out which is going to be the most appropriate route to go down at the moment. I might ask Jeff, what do you, what do you think? Which would be the route to... I, well, I know you focus specifically in the US, but right. it's slightly different. I, well, yeah, I mean, well, in the US, it's, it is a little bit different. Um, you're not a, the the device itself is exempt if from from the the, the FDA classification systems, uh, which is also class one. If you but anyways, if it's delivered by a prosthetist, so it's less about the device and more about the delivery method. Okay, so uh, now the FDA has not really addressed enable because they're giving it away for free. And so it's sort of, you know, it's sort of a, uh, you know, something that's in consideration, but it hasn't been addressed because if no one's actually profiting on it, they're not really paying that much attention to it. No one's gotten hurt yet. So, you know, that, but, uh, you know, the question is, you know, yet, you know, so could the device be delivered directly to an end user without, you know, a prosthetist? Yes, it could, but it could also go horribly wrong. You know what I mean? Uh, and then, uh, so I mean, I definitely obviously advocate for my field in that it's best to have a prosthetist involved because if it doesn't fit right, you now have someone who knows why it didn't fit right and could kind of adjust it as necessary or rebuild it or do whatever needs to be done, um, you know, to make sure that it continues to be fit right. But uh, there is sort of a, now that's where like the UK and the US where there are a plethora of prosthetists around. When we get to the developing world, that becomes a different situation because if, if your choice is not to get a prosthesis or get one versus, you know, get a prosthesis from a prosthetist or get one direct through the mail, you know what I mean? So, you know, if your choice is that you're not actually ever going to get anything, well, then, then you can kind of get a little bit more flexible about those things. I've, I've actually developed a, a socket system called the Monet socket, which is actually a way to 3D print and then customize the socket itself and then, you know, with kind of basic skills, let's say, be able to uh, reform it as necessary. So in the developing world, um, I'm actually very involved in Nepal, uh, even before the earthquake. But, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I see a vision where we can, like, teach, like, a, a craftsman to be able to figure out how to evaluate the fit, you know, work you know, remotely with someone over the internet to kind of figure out what's wrong about it and then adjust it themselves. And so you could teach someone with, you know, a basic level of education, but high level of technical skill to be able to fit prosthetics in the developing world. And that's where I see 3D printing hugely important. And education is the key thing. I know, Nigel, you're maniacal about educating individuals 
um, with some of the challenges. And you're fairly new to 3D print. Uh, you're fairly new to 3D printing in the 3D print world. Um, how are you changing the way in which you communicate with individuals about what's actually out there? Well, I, I mean, I, 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 I'm not particularly educated, and I'm not an expert in, in the field at all. But when I, when I talk to teachers and things like this, I'll say to them, you know, in my day we did metalwork, and the girls did cooking. It's not appropriate now, but we could still do the technology. I, I, I don't know any schools in my area where kids come home and say, look, I've just made you this. It doesn't happen anymore, and it should. And we, we should imp be embracing this technology now so that we, we can stay at the forefront of, of what's coming and, and be sort of world leaders and so that our, our kids can be much better and much smarter than we are because they, they tend to think so much more differently to, to me. Um, they, they just don't seem to have the limitations that were put upon my generation, and, and that's a good thing to see. So I, I think they should be given free reign to push. I mean, I'm sick and tired of hearing about teenagers who get told, you don't know what you're talking about, Sonny, because I'm an expert. And then they, you find out that they found an identifier for colon cancer or whatever, pancreatic cancer at 17. So I think young people have got so much to offer, and, and consequently it should be encouraged in schools. It should be pushed in schools. Uh, part of the curriculum or what, it should be pushed. Just let them go, see what they can come up with. You know, kids are brilliant. So I'm a, a firm, a firm believer in pushing it for schools. Now I'm keen to open up to audience questions, but before I do, I just want to ask you guys um, about what you'd ask of the audience in terms of what improvements do you think are still needed in 3D printing, or even in regards to you're talking about the network and connecting with processes. What's your ask to your audience, and what are the improvements you'd like to see in this field? And I'd like to start with, with Joel on that. Um, improvements. I think uh, it's going to be a technical thing. Uh, I'm, uh, there's so many things to <laughs> talk about. I'm, I'm going to say it's, um, it's, it's the materials. There's, there's, there's a, it's, a, it's to do with the materials. So we were talking about flexi versus solid, but it's not. That there should be a, a wider choice than that. Um, so in the in the 3D printing industry at the moment, there's there's kind of SLS printers that with materials like the Tango from is it three, um, 3D Systems, and those those kind of materials that, that typically degrade either under a high temperature or often under UV light. So in time they just degrade. And we've got a, picked up a sample of Tango in the in the lab the other day just to see what it was like. And as soon as I flexed it, it just tore apart because it had been sitting there for six months. Um, so that's obviously no good, but you do have the flexibility for prototyping there. Mm -hmm. On the FDM side of things, you've got um, loads of cool different materials, but you can't necessarily uh, mix them or print them all. Rich has been doing some work in this, but mixing these materials in the same prints, and, and this is what we want to do. So we want to create a, a biomimetic design where you can have like a bone structure, uh, uh, ligaments, tendons, skin, flesh, all built into the same design. And then you can get all some, some really cool properties like the robustness and the, and the forgiveness of a hand, but with the, the grip and the strength and the uh, and all of those different properties built into the same unit. And when you can 3D print it all in one, mm -hmm. then again your manufacturing time is is or your your labour time in manufacturing is very low, so it's incredibly cost effective. Mm -hmm. So I think that's in in the FDM printing and in the in the materials that the improvements need to be made. And Jeff. Well, I, I was going to say the same thing, but I, I guess I'll now say I, where I see is uh, in digital scanning, you know, because uh, you're making uh, accurate digital scans that someone could do themselves. You know, that, that would be really beneficial because conceivably you could have, um, you know, say like, you know, so me working in Nepal, I could have a technician in Nepal who could take a digital scan email to me, I could kind of do kind of the, the work, send it back to him, you know, we can do like a Google Hangout or Skype, I can see how it gets fit, which by the way, I'm about to do this with someone in India, uh, you know, probably next week, and, uh, you know, just kind of adjust the fit and as is appropriately, and, you know, and then kind of go back and forth like that, but, you know, currently it takes a pretty expensive scanner to be able to get something accurate enough. 
And so if you could, you know, the less expensive, increasing the quality of the less expensive scanners and making it so that they scan reliably, that, that would be where I'd love to see. And Nigel? Uh, I think I'd like to see more integration between the established prosthetics, prosthetics companies, uh, the NHS systems, and, and the new boys, if you like, because everyone's got stuff to learn. I mean, I wouldn't advocate getting rid of the old guard at all. But hey, there is evolution, and we, we need a lot more contact between upcoming technology and, and the old guard who, who've made their careers out of old style prosthetics and, and work together, like I say, for the benefit of the, the person who needs to wear it. You know, I think that's, that's an area where things are going to start changing, I think. I'm hoping they start changing quite rapidly. So there's always people who can solve those problems in audiences like this, and I do want to open up to questions. Um, I think we have a running mic. There we go. Uh, gentleman just here. Um, hello. 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 Um, I'm just concerned. Uh, I just want to know how concerned are you about the reach of this technology? Because you did explain uh, that you were going to India personally, but as a business point of view, this can't be feasible. I mean, like to uh, to reach an economy of scale. You know what I mean? Like how uh, to to benefit a lot of people. Uh, how concerned are you in uh, in in making this technology reach on a global scale? And uh, do you think the economy of scale could really help reducing the cost of your yeah. your product? So, so yeah. if I understand that correctly, the question is about supply chain, and uh, as you scale, the cost yeah. of uh, the materials comes down. Um, yeah. Well, so uh, the uh, so just like. The partial hand devices that we've seen, you know, that enables done, and that, that's mostly been in the media. Um, those are body-powered partial hand devices. Uh, one of the reasons that they, that got so much traction out there is because there's not a company that has actually developed a pediatric version of that body-powered device. There is a company that does a body-powered device that that you know creates the fingers, and then I make the rest of the the, the prosthesis. Let's say. Uh, and it cost, you know, that whole package costs about eight thousand uh, dollars. But you know, there's not actually a pediatric one. And why isn't there a pediatric one? Because, you know, amputees is a, a subset. Then you have pediatric amputees as a subset. Then you have partial hand pediatric amputees as a subset. It's a it's a small market. So people haven't done the the R and D to to be able to to utilize that. Now, 3D printing comes along, and be you you pretty much just press, okay, 70%, you know, instead of 100%, all of a sudden you have something that is a pediatric size. So that, and, and then you just print, instead of like a company having to warehouse, you know, all these different sizes that they've got injection, you know, molded or something like that, you can just print them one off. So, so yeah, 3D printing is going to be a huge thing to kind of lower the barrier of like, um, you know, economy of skies, just because you don't have to warehouse as much. And as you scale up in Barnics, are you finding those issues? Yeah, so I think that's a, that's a really important question because for the, for the, the kind of um, prosthetics industry to be sustainable, the, the people developing it, the, and, and um, we consider our open Bionics as some of the, the people that are developing these devices, we have to be able to sustain the, the company and the development team to keep working on it and keep innovating. Um, so while we're trying to to make things as low cost as possible. We're do doing a few things to try and keep the business sustainable. <laughs> uh, one thing that's not important not to forget is that there, I, I think our figure was 11.4 million hand amputees. Yours was very similar, Nigel, what you yeah. said. But 10 to 12 million hand amputees in the world. So that's an enormous market. Um, but uh, we're, we're also trying to sell our devices within the robotics industry. So we can use some of the, the profits there to help subsidize the rest of the uh -huh. business. Um, and in terms of economies of scale, it is, it's, a, it's a tricky one with 3D printing because the, the way to scale your, your manufacturing plant, you, if you've got one 3D printer, you can double your throughput if you buy a second 3D printer. Um, but the, the economy of scale, it doesn't go dramatically lower with high volumes like it does with traditional manufacturing methods. Um, but equally, you can't use 
any sort of mass manufacture for a one-off custom-made device. So it, I think it just it doesn't scale as well, but it can scale. <laughs> so with extra 3D printers, you don't have to hire loads more people. You only have to buy the printers one time. So you only need a printer and then some space to use it. So it works reasonably well, but you're never going to get the same massive, massive reductions as you do in, in other manufacturing methods. And then it's interesting here about your challenges of running an open source business. One of my closest friends is OpenBCI. Conor Rossonano, great guy, but the issue is how do you become an open source CEO? Because there is the issue of how do you sustain cash flow to actually run it as a business. And I know that the, uh, there's a group in the US called Syntouch, and I think, do you know where is Syntouch? They came out of UCLA, and they're making the uh, haptic fingertips for prosthetics. Now their dream is to go, we want to neurally interface touch back into prosthetic limbs. And everyone's turning around and going, well, neural interfacing touch is maybe 5, 10, 15, 25, maybe longer away. So how do they sustain their company? Well, interestingly, right now, they're using the touch fingertips from these uh, prosthetic fingers to design ergonomic keyboards. So they have clients like, well, I'm not quite sure who their clients are, but there was a new Apple keyboard that was interestingly ergonomically designed. They get clear data from fingertips. So they're able to actually generate cash flows, actually sustain a business, because their dream is to help these people, but the reality is the fact it's five to 15 years out. Are there any other questions? Must be at least one other question. Everyone's like, can, can we go for lunch? Can we go for coffee? All right, so I, I think the, the, the last question I, so sort of want to ask each of you is um, walking around the floor today and looking at uh, what each of the innovators and individuals are doing. Um, what is it you're looking out for? What is the thing? What is it you you want to see at shows like this to help um, each of you innovate and educate yourself and what's available for the future? I'll I'll go first. If yeah. That's right. Because <laughs> I came I came here with a very very specific thing that I was Goal. looking for. Um, it was two things. So I caught up with the guys from uh, uh, Fuel 3D because we, as, as um, Jeff was saying, we're, um, we're looking for uh, a 3D scanner as well that, that can do the, the kind of resolution and, and the, the detail. The one we've got at the moment is kind of pretty good, but it's not quite there. I think that, that echoes Jeff's sentiments. Um, Scanify, cool toy. Going to have to try that out. And the other thing was, was a, a 3D printer that can print in, in multiple materials um, of different properties simultaneously. So the, the coolest one, or the most promising one that I saw was uh, BCN 3D, who have, have the two extruders on the same X rail that can park themselves either end. And they're making the little multicolored lizards. <laughs> that, the, those, that's some of the best dual material 3D prints I've seen. Uh -huh. And I think that idea could has legs. I think it's really cool. Has legs. You do arms, but potentially yeah. has legs. <laughs> and Jeff. Well, I, uh, I'm I'm going to be starting a company. I mean, we're we doing you know 3D printed uh, prosthetic components. You know, utilizing flexible materials. So I'm I'm not looking at what the flexible materials that are out there and kind of how to utilize those better. Uh, you know, just because and mostly you know not so much structural components. You know, I, it's more along the, you know, removing certain parts of it, you know, still use, utilizing, you know, the, the carbon fiber socket, but then, you know, maybe having a terminal device or having the terminal device, you know, lower cost, which maybe we'll get from him, um, <laughs> but then having it more cosmetic, you know, just to make it, make it so that the person can kind of identify with the device more uh, and, and, you know, just be more their fashion, you know. Once again, much like what you did with that 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 fashion model, you know. So that's I think there's there, there's room for that out there in the prosthetic field that we haven't, as prosthetists, haven't done a good job with. And lastly, yeah, I've just been gobsmacked by everything. <laughs> I, I mean, I, to be honest, I, two days ago I wouldn't have known the difference between a 3D printer and a microwave. So I've, <laughs> I've really had my eyes opened, and it. To see some of the things that are coming around, I mean, the, the silicon printed technology, is, it's going to be a boom. I mean, I'm just looking at it purely at people who need 
that technology in their lives, you know, as opposed to people who want that technology in their lives. And some of the stuff I'm seeing is just amazing. You know, um, like you said, the, where you, you can print more than one material together to give you certain properties. I mean, that's, that's going to advance the way fingers and stuff are made in the future because you'll get almost like a tactile sense. You, your brain will rewire. It does rewire, which is really strange. So anything that gives you any sort of tactile feedback, you don't perhaps need the sensors. You, you will, your brain will start picking things up just by the vibrations that you feel through your socket. It's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm really, really happy that I came there. Thank you. And well, I've met a couple of my heroes. Please so. join me in thanking our three absolutely fantastic panelists. And I know the conversation will continue, I hope. Thank you.